Hi, my name is Sebastian Romero. Welcome to my session about LoRaWAN devices. I will give you an introduction on how to use the Arduino Maker Van 1300s together with the Maker NF Shield to read sensor data and exchange it securely with the ThinkStack LoRaWAN backend. I hope you enjoy it. In this session, we're going to have a look at the Arduino platform. We will learn how to install the Maker Van 1300s and the Maker NF Shield. We will read from the sensors of the Maker NF Shields and we'll send messages to the thing stack. Then we'll have a look at how to package data so it can be sent efficiently to the thing stack. We'll also have a look at downlink messages to control the Arduino board remotely. Last but not least, we're going to have a look at the low power functions to maximize the battery life of the Arduino board. Arduino is an open source electronics platform based on an easy to use hardware and software. Arduino allows anyone to innovate by making complex technology easy to use. It does so by abstracting away the complexity of programming hardware and providing a unified API across all products. Arduino is not just a brand or a company or a single microcontroller board, it's actually a whole platform. Arduino offers different microcontroller boards for different use cases. You can have them with uh, different properties such as connectivity, for example, you can have them with Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, um, NB-IoT or LoRa, and they also come in different form factors from uh, very small to medium to a bit larger depending on what you need. There's also an IDE that allows you to program your sketches, to program your firmware that you load onto the microcontrollers. Arduino has its own IoT platform that you can use to remote control your IoT devices. And um, Arduino offers cores for the different microcontrollers, which are sort of the drivers for these boards, and also libraries to for example, read from sensors to control actuators or to achieve uh, advanced logic inside your sketches. Arduino has a huge worldwide community of over 30 million people which can help you with your projects and certainly help you with providing inspiration. There are thousands of third-party libraries created by the community which allow you to use almost any sensor or actuator that you may have. Arduino now also has pro products which comply with industry standards. So you can use them in your solution, in your end product as a module. For this session, we're using the Arduino Maker Van 1300. It comes with a SAMD21 microcontroller that runs on 48 MHz. It has an onboard LoRa module. It also has screw terminals to power it with a battery. It has two decibel of antenna power and supports different carrier frequencies. If you have a look at the Maker Van 1300, you see that it has two rows of pins. You can use these pins to control actuators or to read from sensors that you connect to them. On the right hand side, you see the pinout diagram. It tells you the numbers or the names respectively of those pins so you can refer to them in your code. There's one special one called LED built-in, which tells you how to control the onboard LED in your code. The pins also have a maximum current rating. For the IO pins, they can sync or source a maximum of 7 milliamps. The 5 volt pin supplies whatever your USB power supply offers in terms of current. For the 3.3 volt pin, it depends if you power it through a battery or via USB. If it's via battery, it's uh, whatever the battery offers. But when you power the board through USB, you can draw a maximum of 600 milliamps on these pin. For this session, we're also using the Arduino Maker NF Shield Revision 2. It offers sensor to read atmospheric pressure, the temperature and humidity, and the light intensity in LUX. It also has a slot for a micro SD card, so you can save data to it.
to control a microcontroller, we want to create a sketch. And to do so, we can use the Arduino IDE. You can download it under the indicated URL at the bottom of this page. So it allows you to write a sketch, to install libraries which can extend the functionality of your sketch, to compile your sketch into a firmware that you can then upload to the microcontroller. It also has a serial monitor that you can use to debug your sketch by using print line statements. And it also has a serial plotter so you can plot your data um, on a graph. After installing the IDE, you still need to add support for the MakerVan 1300 board. This is done by installing something called a core. You could also consider it a driver. That core provides access to the hardware features of the microcontroller. The MakerVan 1300 uses the SAMD core and you can install it with the boards manager. So in the tools menu that you can see in the screenshot on the right hand side, you navigate to uh, the board menu and then open the boards manager. You search for SAMD or MakerVan 1300 and install that core. As mentioned before, libraries allow you to extend the functionality of your sketch. And most shields come with their own library, and that's also the case with the Maker NF shield. For this session, you will need three different libraries, one for the Maker NF shield, one for the LoRa van capabilities of the Maker van, and one for the low power capabilities of the board. You can install them through the library manager, you find that if you navigate to the Tools menu and then click on Manage Libraries, and there you search for these libraries and then install them. Another thing that I recommend to do is to update the LoRa firmware. Your Maker One board has a dedicated LoRa module on it, which runs its own firmware. You can update it by uploading a sketch to the Maker Van, which then passes this firmware on to the LoRa module. You will find it in the examples menu after installing the Maker Van library. So you navigate to File Examples Maker Van, and there you will find a sketch called Maker Van Firmware Update Standalone. So you upload it to the board, you open the serial monitor and you will see that the update process starts right away. We've been talking a bit about sketches, but what exactly is a sketch again? A sketch is a program that can be compiled and then it turns into a firmware that you can upload to your board. In Arduino, a sketch consists at least of two functions called setup and loop. Setup is only run once when your board boots, so you can use it to configure sensors and so on. And loop is run repeatedly depending on the frequency of your microcontroller unit. So inside the loop function, you can put whatever logic you want that is executed while your board runs. If you're coming from C or C++ development, you may wonder where the main function is. And there is indeed a main function, but it's hidden inside the core. So the main function calls setup and loop. There are a couple of important Arduino functions that you may want to use in your sketch. I listed a few of them here. There's the setup function, which runs once when the board boots. There is the loop function, which runs repeatedly while the board is powered. There's the delay function, which pauses the execution of your program for a certain amount of milliseconds. There is pin. There is millis, which returns the milliseconds since the sketch started. And that's a very important function because you can use that to implement time-based logic. For example, if you want to um, read the sensors every couple of minutes, you could use millis to figure out when to check. Now you could also use delay but delay really pauses the execution of the sketch, which means no other task can happen during that time. So if you want to implement a logic that is non-blocking, that can, for example, still uh, perform other tasks, 
then you want to use milliseconds together with timestamps to see like when it's time to, to perform an action. There is pin mode, which allows you to configure a pin either as an input or an output. With an input, you could read, for example, from a sensor. With an output, you could control an actuator. There is digital write, which allows you to set the voltage level of a pin to either high or low. And digital read, which allows you to read that voltage level that is applied on a pin. There's analog read, which also reads the voltage on a pin, but this time it's not just high or low, but it actually is within a range of uh, values between 0 and 1023. So it does that by using an analog to digital converter, so you can read an analog signal on that pin. And last but not least, there's analog write, which allows you to configure a PWM value for a pin, which stands for pulse width modulation. I'm not going to go into detail, but in a nutshell, it allows you to set the voltage level on a pin to a certain value by controlling the duty cycle of the signal. For example, you could set a pin to be on 50% of the time, which would result in half of the maximum voltage on that pin. You could use that, for example, to dim an LED or uh, to control a signal. There is a very famous sketch called the Blink Sketch, which can be considered the Hello Worlds program of the Arduino programming. It basically just turns the onboard LED on and off repeatedly. But it's a very easy sketch which allows you to see visually on the board if a sketch has been uploaded successfully. So it's the first thing you want to try out if you have a new board. If you have the Maker Enfield already stacked on top of the Maker Van 1300, you will need to add two more lines of code to make it work. I will show you. Let's have a look at the Blink sketch. I open the Arduino IDE, and then I navigate to the file menu, examples, basics, and Blink. So this opens the Blink sketch, and inside that you see what is going on. So we have the setup function, which is executed once when the board boots, and here we configure the pin to which the LED is connected as an output with the pin mode function. So this allows us to turn the LED on and off. And this is what happens in the loop function. So here we use digital write with a parameter of high to apply a voltage on that pin called LED built in. And the voltage on this board is 3.3 volts. And that makes the LED light up. Then we wait for one second using the delay function and then we execute digital write again now with a value of low which makes the LED turn off. You may notice that there is a second delay function here at the end and this is necessary so if that wasn't here let's comment it out for a second then the LED will turn on for one second and then it will turn off but this was hap this would happen so quickly that you wouldn't even see it because if you don't have a delay, it jumps straight back into the beginning of the loop function where the LED is turned on, so you wouldn't see it. Now, you have to select the board in the Tools menu, which I already did, so this is a Sandy board, Maker Van 1300, and then you also need to select the port to which your board is connected. There should be just one. And then you can click on this arrow to upload that sketch to the board. It compiles the sketch and then it uploads it. And when it's done, you should see your uh, LED on the board blinking. Now, how do we read the sensor values from our Maker Enf shield? First of all, we need to mount the shield on top of the Maker uh, WAN board. It can also go onto the bottom, it doesn't really matter. 
And then we need to include the library that we installed for the maker nf shield. In C, there is this um, include statement that you can use to include the header file of that library, which gives you access to the functionality. Then you need to initialize the sensors of the nf shield, and you can do so by calling nf.begin. It's a very um, it's a pattern that you see often in Arduino. So this uh, begin function is often used to initialize components. And then when you have that, you can read from the sensors. And for that, there's uh, an easy to use API. So for the four sensors that you have on your end shield, you can call the read temperature function, the read humidity, read pressure, and read illuminance function. And they return a float value that you can store into a variable. Reading sensor values from the end shield is also very simple. So I assume you already installed the MakerEnv library, and if you did that, then you can find this example sketch also in the examples menu. So if you navigate to Arduino MakerEnv, you see that there's two different sketches. One is the one that I opened, and then there's another version with Imperial units. In that sketch, we have to first include the library, which is uh, on this line here. And then in the setup function, we have to initialize the sensors. So the board starts to read from the sensors. Here, if, uh, if that fails, a message is printed out, but that shouldn't happen. Then in the loop function, you can see that reading from the four available sensors is very simple. So you call that nf dot uh, read temperature, read humidity, and so on, and store that in a float variable. And once you have that, you probably want to see the value. And uh, you can do so in the IDE by using the serial monitor, which, um, which you can use to print messages to. So here, for example, we print the temperature and humidity and so on. So what I want to do first is to upload that sketch to my board. So I click here on that arrow and it compiles and uploads it directly. And when it's done, I can click on the icon at the top right corner, which opens the serial monitor. And here you can see that it reads the sensor values. If I touch the temperature sensor, it may get a bit warmer. Yeah, it does. And um, you see that these values get updated quite frequently, and that's because there is a delay function here which only has a thousand milliseconds, so one second that it waits. If you want to check those values only every 15 minutes, you would need to adjust that accordingly. Now let's add some LoRa connectivity to the mix. In this session, we're going to use the Thing stack, and we're going to set up a new application for that. So you can go to your region's Thing stack console. So depending on where you are, it, it's either EU1, NAM1, or AU1. And in the console, you set up a new application where you then also register your Maker RAN board and you will have to figure out the device EOI to register it successfully. For that, you can run the provided LoRa dev EOI sketch, which will print out the dev EOI. We don't really need to use the app EOI, so it can be filled with zeros. Now let's create an app with the thing stack so we can exchange some LoRa messages. To do so, you can open the Things Stack console, and depending on where in the world you're based, the URL may be different. So I click on Go to Applications, and here I set up a new one, so I click Add Application. I'm going to keep the owner the same, and here I put Arduino LoRa Demo 4, and create that application. Now that we have the application, we also need to register an end device, which is our maker van board. 
So I click on end devices and then on add end device. And here I select Arduino as the brand. And then for the model, I select MakerVan 1310, which is also compatible with the 1300. And then I select EU as the profile because I'm in the EU. For the frequency plan, I go with the recommended default of a spreading factor of nine. We don't really need the app UI, so you can fill that with zeros. And then you also need to figure out the dev UI of your device. And to do so, I provided a sketch. And if you open that one, it's called LoRa Dev UI. You can uh, run the sketch and it will tell you the device UI. So it basically just uh, starts up the LoRa module and then retrieves the current version that's running on plus the, the device UI. So let's upload that to the board to get that value. When it's done uploading, I can open the serial monitor and I can see the dev UI. So I can copy and paste it. So I have that. For the app key, we can just generate the new one. You will need uh, those uh, things later on for configuring your sketch so it can send messages. <laughs> and that's it. I can click register and device and we're good to go. Now that we've registered our device, let's send a message to the Think stack to see if the connection works. You can open the provided LoRaWAN message sketch and in that one adjust the app UI and the app key depending on what you configured. You may need to adjust the region depending on where in the world you are. If you are outside of the EU, you may need to adjust the channel mask. And that's because uh, the Think stack only uses a subset of channels for certain regions. If that's the case, you can have a look at the LoRaWAN channel mask join sketch, which shows you how to do that. Our sketch simply sends a Hello LoRa World message over LoRaWAN to the Think stack. And the API for that is modem.print, which accepts a string. In the screenshot, you can see that in the console, we received two messages. The first one was a join request, which was received when connecting to the network. And then the second one is the actual uplink data message, which contains our Hello World message. Let's try to send a message now from the Maker Van board to the Things stack. Before we do that, we want to go to Payload Formatters and select JavaScript and click Save. So this is going to use a default uh, JavaScript decoder, which will show you the raw bytes of your message. Then we can go back to Overview. To send that message, I prepared a sketch, which is called Laura Van Message. So you can use that. And in that sketch, the same thing happens as we saw before. The modem gets initialized. It prints out a few details about the modem, like the, the firmware version and so on. And then here on line 20, 28, it actually connects to the network over OTAA. And to do that, it needs the app UI and the app key. And those values, they come from another file called Arduino Secrets. So we need to define them here. We left the app UI at zero, so that can be kept like that, but the app key, we need to copy it. So let's go to the thing stack console and find that value. So here there's an app key, and we can use that icon here to copy it to the clipboard. We switch back to the IDE and paste it. Save the file, and we're good. So this should now connect successfully to the network. If it doesn't, it will print out a message as saying that something went wrong. Then it waits for a few seconds and then starts to send a message. Each message can be sent to a different port. And in this case, we selected port number three, but for our use case, it really doesn't matter so much. 
So we start to craft or put together a packet of data. So we execute the begin packet function. We use the print method here to store the bytes of this hello world string into it. And then with modem.end packets, we send it off to the network. The parameter here is um, it basically defines if you want the packet to be um, confirmed or not. But you can ignore that for now. If the message is sent successfully, you should see a message in the serial monitor. So let's try that. Let's upload the sketch to the board. And here we can switch to the live data. Let me clear the log. Now it uploaded to the board. Let me open the serial monitor to see what happens. Now it's connecting to the network. So I can already see in the console that there was a show and request message. That's wonderful. And then now the message was sent successfully. And you can see here that now we have the, the actual payload. So we have the, the bytes of the message. So somewhere here, there is hello world message hidden inside those bytes. To make them readable, we have to implement something uh, called a payload formatter, and we're going to have a look at that. You may have noticed that the message that was received in the things that console didn't really look like text. And that's because we just sent a stream of bytes. And the thing stack backend doesn't really know what to do with it unless we tell it. So we need to decode the data that we sent. In our case, we've sent ASCII text, which encodes the characters with one byte. So in total, we have sent 13 characters, which correspond to 13 bytes. So we need to convert that back to a string, and that can be easily done with a payload decoder in the ThingStack backend. You can define one per app or even one per device. In this session, we're going to have a look at a JavaScript decoder. In order to see those bytes translated back into a string, we need to implement a string payload formatter. I created a JavaScript snippet for you that you can use. You can find it in the payload format a string file. And let's just copy paste that function. So I copied it, then I go to payload formatters and I paste it here. And I click save. So in that function, what happens is that it goes through all the bytes that it gets from the input and then uses the string dot from char codes to turn it back into a character from the ASCII table. So it looks it up on the table, turns it back into a character, and then composes a complete string with the single characters, which is then stored in the results variable. And then eventually this function, the decode function, composes a, an object which contains a data property, and inside that data property, we now have the, uh, the the bytes, so the raw input bytes, plus a message property which contains the the string that we send from the Arduino board. Now, if we go back to live data and we execute the same sketch again, and we can do so by just clicking the reset button on the board. We should now get the same message again, but now decoded as a string. Let's see if it works. Now it's connecting. And the message was sent successfully, so let's see. OK, now you can see that we also got the raw input bytes, as we specified. But on top of that, we now have the, the LoRa Hello Laura world message here in this packet decoded. Now that we know how to convert data, we can have a look at how to send sensor data to the thing stack. Previously, we have sent a simple string, 
and now we want to send a numeric value. In our case, the sensor data is stored as a floating point number. The maker van library provides a specific function for that, modem.write. It allows to also supply the data type. That way it knows exactly how many bytes it needs to send. On the decoder side, what needs to happen is it has to chop the byte stream into chunks. For example, if we send three sensor values, it has to chop the stream into three different pieces. Also, it has to reverse the byte order because the values are sent as big Indian, while on the receiver side, little Indian is expected. We're dealing here with floats, so the bytes are to be converted also on the receiving side back into floats. And last but not least, the converted data has to be uh, turned into a data object that holds all that data. Now that we have successfully converted a byte stream into a string, let's think about how can we send the sensor values from the maker end shield to the thing stack backend. We could send those sensor values also as strings, but since the LoRa bandwidth is a little bit limited, we want to make sure that we use as few bytes as possible to send that data. So let's make use of the original data structure, a float, to send those values. I prepared another sketch called Read Sensors LoRaWAN, which shows you how to do so. So in this sketch, in the setup function, it initializes the NF shield, as you have seen before. It initializes also the modem with the European region here. And then it connects to the network. So again, it uses the join OTAA function to join the network. Then, let me scroll down a little bit more. In the loop function, we read the sensor values from the NF shield and store them into these floating point uh, variables. Then we print those variables again to the uh, serial monitor, but also now on top of that, we send them to the network with the send sensor values function. So let's check that one out. In this function, we do the same thing as before. We create a new packet with the begin packet function. But now we use a different function to write data to it. So we did use the print function, and now we use the write function, which also accepts the data structure here. So it knows how many bytes to send. And then you pass it the variable that you want to send. So we do that for all the different properties that we want to send. And then we end the packet here with modem.end packet. And this sends it off to the network. If everything went fine, you should see that uh, message here. Now, we've been using a string decoder, but now we're using floats, so we also have to adjust that. So if we go back to the things that console, let's go to payload formatters and replace the one that we have here. I prepared a snippet for, uh, for floats, which I'm going to copy-paste and put it here and, and save the changes. So let's quickly have a look at it. What happens is that here, let me zoom in a little bit, in the decode function, it receives again the input data stream. And now we define the float size to be four bytes, which is the case um, on Arduino. And then we save the data that we receive into a buffer and once we have that we can extract it again and turn them into floats. So this is done through a data structure called data view and in the data view we basically loop over the whole um, packet of bytes and we always take four bytes at a time and then turn them back into a floating point number using the getFloat32 function. So that gives us the, the float value that we had on the Arduino side as well. And that one is then saved into an array called sensor data. 
eventually we translate these values into uh, a more readable string. So we construct a new object called beta, and then that one has properties such as temperature, humidity, pressure, illuminance. And here we add the float values and the unit that we've been using as a string. So let's save that again, and let's go back to live data, and let's try to send a message. So I'm going to upload that sketch to the board. Now it's uploaded. Let me open the serial monitor to see what's going on. It's connecting to the network. You can also see that in the back by that uh, join request message. Now it's waiting a few seconds it reads the sensors and it sent them successfully as a message. So let's see what we received. Let me zoom in a little bit. So now you can see that again we received a stream of bytes and here you can see the raw input bytes. But now we also have the humidity that we read, we have the illuminance and the pressure and the temperature as nice properties inside that data structure. So let's quickly double check if the values match. And you can see that temperature 31, humidity 51, so that works just fine. So far, we only talked about uplink messages, which means messages sent from the end device to the thing stack. But the things console also allows you to send downlink messages. You can use that to control your microcontroller board. The MakerVan library implements a polling mechanism which corresponds to a class A device, um, which allows you to read downstream data. It does so by sending a one byte dummy message which opens a downlink receiving window. And the downlink messages are also sent as byte streams. For example, you could send a 1 to then turn on the onboard LED, or you could send a 0 to turn it off. So let's send a downlink message from the thing stack back to the end device to control it. So in our case, what we want to do is that we want to send a 1 to the maker van board, so it turns on an LED or a zero to turn the LED off. To send a downlink message, you can navigate in the Things Stack console to the Messaging tab, and then to Downlink. So here you can add your payload and schedule a downlink for the device. I prepared a sketch for the Arduino board, which is called Laravan Downlink, and let's have a look at that one. So here, since we want to use the onboard LED, we configure it here with pin mode as an output. And then we initialize again the modem, so we're able to connect. And then here we join the network using OTAA, as we did before, nothing new. And then we have to define the polling interval. So in order to be able to receive downlink messages, the device has to pull for that data every now and then. So uh, it has to actively open a receive window. And here we define that to be once a minute. So once a minute, it will actually send a dummy message, which in turn opens a receive window so it can download the, the downlink message. In the loop function, since we already know that we're not going to check more often than once a minute, we can put the board to sleep for a minute. And then using the poll function, we send that dummy data, open the receive window, and then we wait a few seconds to receive data. And then we check if data was available. If we received any data, we can then proceed to process it. We need to store that data somewhere, so we create a buffer here with 64 bytes. And then while we get uh, data from the modem, we store it into that buffer. 
Here we just basically print out what we received, but more importantly we want to check what was in the buffer. So we check the first byte in the buffer and if it was a 1, we're going to turn the LED on. If it was a 0, we're going to turn it off. So let's upload that sketch to the board and let's see if it works. In the meantime, I can already switch to the console and add my payload. So I want to send a 1 in hexadecimal format and schedule this downlink message. So let me try that. So I'll go back to my sketch, open the serial monitor. I switch back to the live data tab. There are some messages that are being received. Now it waits until it receives a message. So let's see how long that takes. It should be more or less one or two minutes. So now that we have successfully retrieved a one message here, the LED on my board turned on and uh, the same thing should happen on your board as well. If we would now schedule another downlink message with a payload of zero, it will turn the LED off. You may want to deploy your device in a place where you cannot power it through the mains, but you can power it with a battery. For example, you could deploy it on a mountain. If you do that, you need to take care of the power consumption so the battery doesn't drain so quickly. You can do that by letting the board sleep whenever it doesn't have to do any work. For example, when it doesn't have to read from the sensors, when it doesn't have to transmit any data, it can be sleeping. If you're using the Arduino Low Power Library, it provides different sleep modes. Um, the functions are idle, sleep, and deep sleep, and they turn off different components. So the more components that you turn off, the less power it's going to consume. If you provide a delay, it will wake up again after that specified amount of milliseconds, but you could also let it sleep forever and only wake it up with an external component by attaching an interrupt to a pin. For example, you could use an external sensor and um, wake the board up only when there is motion detected, for example. To demonstrate the low power functions, I created another sketch called Read Sensors Loravan Low Power. It's essentially the same sketch that you saw before, but here I included the low power library. If you scroll down to the very bottom, you will see that I am no longer using the delay function to put the board to sleep, but I'm using the low power sleep functions. Even if you use the delay function, the board consumes very little energy. But if you want to further reduce the power consumption, you can use the low power library. There are a few different functions and depending on which one you use, it will draw even less current. And it does so by turning off more and more um, components on the board that are not required during the sleep. You can specify a time during which the board is supposed to sleep or you could even put the board to sleep forever and only wake it up externally. And that means you could connect an external device, an external sensor, for example a motion sensor, and only wake the board up when there's some motion detected, for example. If you want to take it one step further, you could integrate your device with Arduino IoT. There you can see your sensor data on a nice dashboard, or you can control your device via a customizable user interface. You can integrate the ThingStack with Arduino IoT via webhooks. The assignment of this session is to create your very own LoRa-powered environment sensor station. There are a couple of warm-up tasks, which basically repeat the steps that we have gone through together. And then there are additional tasks, 
which require you to implement additional logic on top of the provided code. There are even bonus tasks that you can work on if you have time. Have fun and thank you so much for listening.